All right. Thanks for joining, guys. And uh, for everybody out there, thanks for showing up. Hopefully, uh, we do this without a hitch. Um, it is, you know, technology. And um, since everybody's, you know, kind of at home and not, uh, you know, they're, they're live streaming everything like Netflix and Zooms and everything, things may get a little shaky around here. But um, we'll do the best we can. Hopefully, you guys can hear us. And hopefully you can see us. And what I'm going to do right now is uh, present um, a little deck that uh, we put together that basically tells you a little bit about us and what what you can hope to get out of joining gig economics. So here goes. All right. So what we got here is um, our first slide, which is just gig, gig economics. And and you know when we first thought up this idea, it was before the pandemic. So we were going under the guise of uh, you know escape from cubicle hell and create the life you want. Things things are a little bit different now because uh, your job may have escaped you from cubicle hell, and now you're sitting at home. But in any event, go ahead. <laughs> okay, um, so what what we're going to cover in this um, in this event tonight is what gig economics is and how it came about, and that's the what. Uh, we're going to talk about origin stories of the founders, that's the who. Um, we're going to have uh, an invitation at the end, and that's the how and the where. And this live stream covers the when, as in right now. So, what is gig economics? It's a term that means the study of the gig economy that has emerged over the past few years. So you're probably asking, what's the gig economy? What, what the heck does that mean? And to give you a clue, you can look at the bottom of the slides and you'll see uh, some of the gigs that you can do um, in a gig economy. That is just six. You can, you know, there's, there's hundreds more. So in a gig economy, temporary flexible jobs are commonplace and companies tend toward hiring independent contractors and freelancers instead of full-time employees. A gig economy undermines the traditional economy of full-time workers who rarely change positions and instead focus on a lifetime career. All that is about to change. There's two key words in that uh, slide, uh, previous slide, temporary and flexible. So think about that. Gig workers do not have or expect a career. What they seek is freedom to create their own schedule and their own work. They seek work that may be more fulfilling than a, typi than a typical job without the headaches of a nine to five job. So let's dig a little deeper. You know, this is not your grandparents' economy, though it may seem so since they lived through a Great Depression too, which I think we're in again, and I hope I'm wrong. Um, even, but even before the pandemic, the writing was on the wall. There aren't any gold watches anymore, nobody's getting pensions, and people don't have jobs for life in this country. Some facts. Prior to COVID-19, 36% 30, of the US workforce worked in the gig economy, and that's you know the Ubers, the Lyfts, freelance, Amazon delivery, internet marketers, you name it. 401k plans have taken over from pensions, and odds are, you know, since the pandemic and, and everything got shut down, you've probably lost at least 25% out of your 401k if you had one to begin with. And the sad fact is employers care more about their shareholders than their employees. And there's a reason for that, but it's, and it's not all bad. In fact, they're legally bound to, they have to serve, they have to maximize shareholder value that's in their charter. Globalization has opened a new world and destroyed industry and individual businesses alike. But there is an answer. Start a gig and start it now. But how, you might ask. And this is one of the overarching concepts that we're gonna focus on in gig economics. And that is number one, start with where you are, use what you have and do what you can. You are unique, just like everybody else. <laughs> um, you have skills. They're probably not unique unless you're that guy who wrangles alligators with one arm. You do have experience in something. You may even have expertise. 
Your life experiences are unique. Nobody's had the life you've had. And if you're an expert in your field, you're probably one of just a very few. So you're pretty close to unique there too. However, the intersection of your skill set and experience is, is undoubtedly unique. The trick here really is to com combine your skills, experience, and technology into a unique revenue generating venture that positions you as an expert in your field. Simple, right? Uh -huh. um, so your mission, if you choose to accept it, is number one, brainstorm. What, what are you good at? What skills, experience, and technology can you bring together to solve a problem, remove some pain, or give pleasure to somebody that is unique enough that nobody else is doing it? And then you need to put together a plan. How will you do it? How will you sell it? Who and where are your customers? And make sure you write it down and share it with somebody because that makes it real. And the last thing is fill in any gaps. There are going to be things you don't know. You know, but again, start where you are, use what you have and do what you can and fill in any gaps you identify with partners, training or tools. So now I want you to meet Callan Don. And uh, I'm going to put him back in the stream so that you can see him and you can hear him. So take it yep. away. Callan. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Callan. I've been a lifelong entrepreneur and, you know, my whole life, I've really had this draw and this pull to work for myself. Uh, I always wanted that freedom to just uh, be able to work when I need to, work when I want to, work doing what I want, how I want, when I want. And that's something that hasn't ever been realistic in terms of keeping a normal job. Um, you know, I've I've done sales for a very long time. I was successful at it. Um, really enjoyed doing sales, but there was just always that nagging feeling that I, I just wasn't being fulfilled in a way that I wanted to be fulfilled. So um, long story short, I ended up with a back injury in the middle of a uh, sales career, left me unable to walk for four months. And that started me down the path of exploring uh, eight, online marketing, working on the internet, freelancing and, and gigging. And, and I've, I've done all kinds of stuff in that time, anything from um, working with uh, Mechanical Turk, where you're doing jobs for a, a penny at a time that are small and repetitive, uh, all the way up to uh, what I do now, which which is par partly the gig economy and uh, managing advertisement. Cool. All right. Let's take it away to Zane. Let me get you in the stream. All right, take it away. Yeah. All right, so uh, my name is Zane Miller, and um, I would say I'm a born entrepreneur. The joke in my family is that I've had more jobs and gigs than the grandpas had birthdays, right? Um, I, I never really understood. I mean, it took me a long time to put two and two together of what I was doing was entrepreneur and just what I felt like doing. I, I was just, I, I was, I'm the youngest of eight kids. Um, I'm an introvert, but you'd never guess. Um, but I was just that latchkey kid who just sort of figured stuff out really, really quick. And then before you knew it, I was already doing the thing and uh, everyone, everyone was just like, all right, just, just let him do his thing. Uh, from a very young age, I was the kid who was mowing lawns, um, uh, trying something new. Um, People always said I was always scheming. That's not always a bad word, but I never really liked it. But yeah, I, I always had a plan. I always had an idea. There was always something I wanted to test. There was always something I wanted to try. So um, I, I grew up throughout the, uh, the internet sort of uh, dawning, so to speak. And I quickly found interest in tech and video. Um, I'm a huge uh, video game sort of nerd. And so... Uh, between being one of those kids who was just sort of uh, pushed on to the performing stage uh, because I, I had to, a lot of kids, um, I saw the pieces of technology and performing sort of coming together. And as Bill was saying before, you just take what you've got and you keep going with it. And so I leveraged what I saw of the, of the spotlight and technology and all those pieces coming together. And I started... Uh, working with YouTube and marketing on YouTube in 2008 
And I've pretty much just been building my experience from there, taking all the stuff that I've learned as a kid, as a performer and saying, okay, so if I was going to do this for somebody else, or I was going to teach somebody else, um, I would take them through thus and such. Um, I've helped many businesses uh, create their own YouTube channels, um, sort of uh, come out of their shell, so to speak, and really show the benefits of what they can do um, on the space of YouTube and video. And I wanna take that and leverage that because now we're in a whole new world of technology in 2020 and there's always something to learn. And I'm a big proponent of learning through doing and teaching through example. So I appreciate being here and uh, back to you, Bill. All right, thanks. And now we'll talk about me just for a second. Um, let's see here. Uh, wrong way. All right. That's, that's the fun with technology. I will get used to this. Um, so I began this crazy journey in 1996 where I started building websites. I didn't know anything about how to build a website. I mean, the web was brand new for all intents and purposes. Um, I think it was like mainstream in 93 or four. So I kind of got into it early. Um, and uh, so I, I, I learned how to uh, write code uh, in HTML and other horrible tech acronyms um, like PHP and all CSS and all that other junk. Um, I switched to uh, I switched my focus to e-commerce pretty early on um, back in 2001, where I learned how to sell stuff on the internet, um, whether it was eBay, my own site, um, you know, whatever. Um, and then I I started. I got real serious in building out a niche website and I learned a ton through trial and error, mostly error. Um, and I discovered that nobody knew crap about any of this stuff. And I decided to teach people what I learned on my own. Um, so I, I developed some training tutorials that sold thousands of copies uh, back in around 2010. And that put me on the map with a lot of uh, marketers and uh, business people. And it, it really got me focused on teaching, pe teaching people. And, and this is what I say on, on my own personal website. I teach people how to do stuff on the Internet. And that's, that's kind of what I'm bringing to this table. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to be here and I'm happy to be uh, joined with these, these two gentlemen who I think we bring a lot of um, experience and knowledge to the table. And I hope that you all can learn a world of information from us. Awesome. So I started um, a website, or I, I, let me back up. I got interested in the gig economy a couple of years ago when um, it became apparent that, you know, the Ubers and the Lyfts and the Airbnbs and, and kind of those mechanical Turk and all those other things, uh, TaskRabbit, I think was one of them, um, where they were becoming um, more mainstream and, uh, you know, private sector jobs and government jobs, you know, ba basically jobs, nine to five, so-called. Um, were becoming a little scarcer. Um, the workforce was growing, so you know the the job market kept growing as well. But it seemed like there were a lot more people who were either underemployed or um, unemployed or unemployable. And so last year, I finally got around to doing something about it, and I I bought the domain GigEconomics.com, and I put it on the shelf for a while because I was doing other things just like we all do. And then most marketers that I know have like the squirrel gnat uh, attention span. And I went off and did other, other things. Um, but when the pandemic hit and the economy virtually shut down, two things happened simultaneously. Number one, I decided to do something with the concept because I knew a lot of people were going to be hurt really, really, really badly. And I knew I could help them. And number two, I quote unquote remet Zane, um, and I'll tell you, we'll tell you about that story in a minute. And we started talking, and you know, as as you know, he he didn't toot his horn as as much as I'm going to in 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 this uh, presentation and in the future. But he's an expert in YouTube, and that's that's how I got to know him. 
and he he knows subscriber sequences and he's done his own number of gigs over the over the last 10 plus years so he's very knowledgeable in what we're about to teach you um and one thing led to another zane introduced me to callan and here we are um so real quick i'm gonna um share the screen again with everybody and hopefully everybody can see this yeah it makes this presentation a little small but um so i think it was 2010 when zane and i met and we met at a marketing conference or a seminar or whatever marketing event and um practical profits right i think it was Something practical like profits yeah, yeah. And, and you know I had never, we had never met before and I was one of a hundred people in the crowd and so was he, but he actually um, was kind of called out um, for his expertise and he was doing something that was really novel back then, which was he knew YouTube and he knew how to make it work and he was running shows and stuff. So he's perfect for this gig. Um, and we kind of went our separate way and 10 years later, here we are. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, go ahead. No, I, I just, I, I want to make sure like if, if you're, if you're steering the boat, um, but if you want me to, to, to tack on to anything here, go on, go on. All right. Okay. Yeah. I, I was always impressed with Bill. He was, he's like um, to that, to that end, if we're, if we're tooting each other's horns here, um, I'm going to start tooting uh, on, on Bill here. Cause um, I, the the industry is filled with a lot of talkers and a lot of yeah you know oh yeah i'm totally gonna do that and um for somebody who who sees the potential right i i, I saw the value in performing and doing a good job and uh you know i'm classically trained thespian right <laughs> so uh when i would see people get on and start making a youtube video or a channel or something like that None of it had to do with any tech or any. It was just like no, 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 no. Focus on what you you're looking at the camera. You're you're talking to another person. That's it. Don't don't think about anything else. Pretend you're having a conversation, and then pretend you have to watch that conversation. That's what we're connecting with. Put technology out of your mind and go right back into the human experience. And that was ninety percent of the work. But that's that's ninety percent of the work. You figure out how you communicate, and then you play with the tech after that. So, like the the novelty was, yeah, I can click the dials and do the things. But the the real power and experience that I realized was the benefit was all of the many years of of hearing uh, drama teachers and directors being like, "No, do it right, right you over and over and over again. And so, what I always noticed was people who actually understood how to do the work. And that's the other reason why I, I was so inspired by gig economics and Bill's viewpoint is it all starts with your skills, experience, and then technology. And everybody wants to start with technology first. And I think that's the that that's the very first bottleneck that you're gonna run into. What do you think, Bill? Oh, absolutely. And, and the thing is, I used to be afraid of technology until I decided I wasn't gonna be afraid of technology. Because what's the worst that can happen? You screw up. And and you know what? One of the main things I want everybody to take away from, from this event, as well as from any other things that we do, is um, you learn by doing. And you know, you learn by screwing up too. And you know, I look back at people like, you know, Bill Gates, for example, when he was actively at Microsoft as their CEO, and he would give presentations in PowerPoint, kind of like we're doing here. And, you know, he'd be in a room full of, you know, hundreds of people and thousands of people are watching this thing. And, the you know, windows would crash, you know, his flagship product would crash. And it's like, big surprise. Did he cry? Did he did he quit? Did he, you know, no, he he kept going. And, you know, I started dabbling with servers and stuff like that back in the, in the late nineties. Um, part of the way I got started was more of, it was less web stuff and more tech stuff. Like, um, 
I had a business partner then and, and we started um, a, a, a consulting business and we had no experience in this. We just, you know, we were 20 something and we said, let's just do this thing. And so we got a couple, you know, we got a few clients and um, we branched out into doing things that they needed that we didn't necessarily know how to do, but we learned how to do them. Um, we had other friends in, in tech and stuff like that. And we would just reach out to them and say, Hey, how do you do this? And sometimes they would come into the office with us, you know, during the off hours or whatever, when we were doing the work and they do it for us and we pay them. Sometimes they just tell us, but you know, the bottom line is you just, you can't be afraid of things. You have to, you know, I mean, there are obviously some things you should be afraid of, like, a, a, you know, if you're camping and there's a bear in your campground and it's a grizzly, you should probably be afraid of that. Yeah, he's not but, gentle, Ben. No, no, no. But, you know, technology, I mean, unless it's unless it's a really expensive thing that you have in your hands and you drop it and it breaks, there's nothing that's really going to break. I mean, yeah, it'll break, but you can fix it. Um, so don't, don't, don't be worried about technology. And the, and the fact of the matter is technology is so much better now than it was even five years ago, oh, yeah. but yeah. It's probably 10 years ago, Zane and I were talking the other night about, you know, whenever you would just try to download or watch a video, you know, you'd have that little buffering thing and it would do that for 10 minutes and not to mention that, you know, the modems were with a, you know, be dong, be dong. <laughs> the noises and stuff. Take, yeah. would take half an hour to log on to AOL or whatever. And that's why people yeah. never turned it off. But you, it, but you worked with it. You're like, okay, if this is what, if this is what it takes, then you set it up and then you go make a cup of coffee. You clean your bathroom, you do whatever you got to do. And now it's Watch just like, oh, that, yeah, that, that's that's already happened. Cool. You, now you I can just start your downloads on. at night when you go to sleep, and then hope it didn't exactly. disconnect before you got up in the morning. Right? Yeah. Exactly. Now, I, I, I do. I do want to make a point. I because because I did sort of stand on ceremony about the point of just like, well, you gotta gotta get good at being being good. Um, but there is there there comes a point where you get comfortable with it with your your performance and you need to get comfortable with technology, which is why I'm so glad that Callum's here to strike the contrast between, uh, you know, being prepared, but then also embracing the technology you already have, because I mean, come on, look at, look at Callum and then look at us. Now look at Callum. There, <laughs> there's a difference, but, but my, again, my point is, is that Callum did not, did not fear the, the technology or anything like that. He embraced it and he just kept rolling with it and rolling with it and rolling with it. And you can see how comfortable he is with it because he put in the time, right? So you put in the time to get to, to get comfortable with yourself and your own presentation, but then you have to match that with the technology and be willing to do it. Because if not, I suffered from that myself. I, I, I spent too much time working on the core stuff and not enough of the polish and you absolutely need you need polish. It's important. We're talking about people's, um, it's, it's been brought up a lot of times, but you're talking about the amygdala in the back of people's brains. It's called, uh, it's also known as the lizard brain, right? And the lizard brain just wants to make sure it's, uh, it's safe and secure and happy and polish does that. So yes, work on the core, work on the presentation, work on your diction and pronunciation, but also make sure that you take the time to understand the technology. But that's why we're also here is to help you with that part as well. Yeah, the, the effect of technology just absolutely does not work if all of the underpinnings are not in place already. You know, you can have this, you know, you can have the the best audio, the best video, the best wild background, the all the bells and whistles and animated intros and all kinds of fun stuff, but in the end if the content that you're bringing in doesn't work. All the tech falls flat on its face because nobody cares about any of that. It's like watching that movie that looks amazing in the trailers, but they gave you all the spoilers in the trailer. And yep. then you're just left disappointed after you paid to go see that movie. This is the same thing. Technology should enhance your skills, not the other way around. And I, the other I, thing you have to keep in mind is your customers... And, and you will have customers if you start gigs. 
they don't really care about the technology you use. They only care about the product, the end, the end result. Um, so, I mean, I know people who, you know, sell hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of stuff and they do it all manually. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, it, it all, it all depends on where you want to play and how much you want to dig into this, but you don't really need to load yourself down with a bunch of tech. What you need, I mean, I think what you need is a website, some e uh, an email service provider. And if you're going to do streams like this, you need something like, you know, Facebook Live, which is native, or BeLive, or StreamYard, which are fairly inexpensive. Um, you might need to print up some flyers or something, but to get started, you don't need a lot. And what you do as you earn revenue, you take a portion of that revenue, whatever you're comfortable with, and you plow it back into the business so that you can buy things to automate and systematize your business. That's it. Exactly. Yeah. You don't you don't buy you don't buy a ten thousand dollar expectation. System, you know, before you've made a dime. That's not prudent. But but again, you you can't automate and systematize your business unless you're comfortable with the manual process and that manual process is proven and works. Otherwise you're going to automate and systematize something that's broken and you're going to be pay, paying for all of the tech to lose money. Yep. Yep. Not so fun. So the tech is to, to me, and I think we're all saying this, the tech is kind of last, not last in priority, but last in execution. Because as Callan said, if you automate crap, you're just going to have faster crap. That's it. That's it. But you're not, you know, you got to, you got to solidify, you got to really make um, everything work. And, and that's not to say, you know, in the corporate world, they talk about flawless execution and that's bullshit. There is no such thing as flawless execution. Well uh, said. There's, there's getting pretty damn close to perfect and you should always strive for getting better, but at what cost? You know, um, many, many companies, even big ones like Fortune 50 companies, rather than go out and buy a bunch of software or hardware or consulting to, to, to make their technology work better, they hire more people because people can do things. You can tell people how to do things. And then once you get the process down, you document it and you can repeat it with high enough success that you're happy with then you can automate it or semi-automate it. Yeah, that's that's very well said. I I've just lost my point. Never mind. Sorry. Moving on. <laughs> um, See right 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 there. You can you can flub and you go. Oh my bad. Move on. Yeah, I mean, you know when when you're giving when you're giving a presentation. Let let let's say let's say you start a side hustle or a side gig or whatever you want to call it. Um, and, and, and let me, let's back up real quick. If you have a job and you're currently employed, don't quit. <laughs> yeah. Keep, keep going. You know, we have 24 hours in a day and I know some of us have kids and we have other obligations and we may, you know, we have a full-time job or we have a part-time job, whatever. You can spare one or two hours that you spend right now watching TV or playing on social media. You could spend one or two hours a day creating a gig and building it out. You just can. If you think you can't, you're wrong or you're not, you're not making the effort. Um, but you can spare those one to two hours, but it's better to keep your job, keep your benefits, um, keep your peace of mind that, you know, you're going to be able to pay your bills. And then the, the side gigs you do are gravy or they're, to pay for a vacation you want to take or there to put money in your savings account or your kid's college fund or whatever at the point where you're starting to make the same amount of income with your, with your side hustles or your gigs um, compared to your job. That's when you need to start thinking about, mm, should I quit my job? And I would still say until you're way past, uh, equaling your job income, you shouldn't even, you shouldn't really strongly consider it because if you're monthly nut, if, if it takes you 
let's just say I, I'm going to throw a number out there and it's not representative of anybody I know um, or anybody specific, but let's say, let's say you need $3,000 in net income to pay your bills, pay your rent or mortgage, pay for groceries, pay for the thing, you know, car insurance, all that kind of stuff, all the necessities, food, um, let's say it's $3,000 and you start making $3,000 after, let's say six months, 